This episode of Food Psych is brought to you by my book, Anti-Diet, Reclaim Your Time, Money, Well-Being, and Happiness Through Intuitive Eating, which is available wherever books are sold. Just go to christyharrison.com slash book to order it now. That's christyharrison.com slash book. Welcome to Food Psych, a podcast about intuitive eating, health at every size, body liberation, and taking down diet culture. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm an anti-diet registered dietitian, certified intuitive eating counselor, and author of Anti-Diet. Join me here every week as I interview interesting people from all different backgrounds about their paths toward peace with food and their bodies. And by the way, on this show, we bleep out diet culture stuff like weight and calorie numbers, but we don't censor swear words or other adult language, so listener discretion is advised. Hey there, welcome to episode 270 of Food Psych. I'm your host, Christy Harrison. And today I'm talking with Health at Every Size therapist Nancy Ellis Ordway about weight stigma in education, healthcare, and beyond, how a focus on weight and individual responsibility distracts from addressing more important systemic issues, the evolution of health at every size over time, the role of money and industry in perpetuating diet culture, and so much more. I can't wait to share our conversation with you in just a moment. It's a really good one with someone who's been in the field for a very long time. But first, I have a big announcement to make, and it comes with some good news and some bittersweet news. The good news is that I got my second book deal, and I'm really so excited for this because writing books is the thing I love doing the most. And I feel like especially in this world of social media and the internet, creating this constant churn of short little pieces of content, books are something really special and enduring, more so than ever before. And I'm especially psyched about this book because it's on a topic I'm super passionate and curious about. So the working title is Rethinking Wellness, and I'm widening the lens from diet culture, although I'm still talking about diet culture, of course, but I'm also talking about how all of us, particularly women and marginalized people, are being harmed by unproven quote-unquote wellness practices and unfounded health beliefs, how we can stop the spread of wellness misinformation and disinformation, which are so rampant right now, and what it will take to create a truly health-promoting society. It's being published by Little Brown and Company's Spark Imprint, who's the same publisher I worked with for Anti-Diet, because I love my editor and the whole team there, and they've done such a great job of helping Anti-Diet out into the world. That book actually just went into its fourth printing, which is so amazing, and it's been translated into at least three other languages so far, and I'm just so grateful and impressed by all the work that the Spark team has done to make that happen, and also, by the way, that all of you who've bought the book and shared about the book have done to make that happen, too, so thank you. And of course, book publishing is a long process, so this new book, Rethinking Wellness, won't be out until early 2023, which feels like forever, but actually I don't have that full two years to write it. I really only have less than a year because in traditional publishing, about half the time to publication is devoted to things like physical production, printing, distribution, and all that stuff, and of course the editing and fine-tuning of the book. And so that brings me to the bittersweet news, which is that because I'm covering such a huge topic in this book and have relatively little time to do it, I've had to really pare down my commitments to other things. And unfortunately, that's going to have to include this podcast. So we'll be going on hiatus starting on March 15th. And I'm hoping to come back with season nine sometime in late 2021 or early 2022. But I don't have a date nailed down yet. This is a really tough decision because I love this podcast so much, and it's been so great connecting with you here over the years with all of you, but I just have limited capacity right now, and I need to honor that. 
I'm not a big business. I have a few people on my team who help me with a few aspects of this podcast, but my role as the executive producer and the host takes a lot of time and energy and money that I unfortunately won't be able to give while writing this book. And above all, I just don't want to sacrifice the attention and level of the content that I create for you here. But all that being said, I do have one more piece of good news, which is that I'll still be able to keep doing one of the aspects of this podcast, just in a different medium. So starting next week, I'll be answering your questions every week in my newsletter, which is now going to be called Food Psych Weekly. So for our remaining six episodes here, including this one, I won't be doing a listener Q&A on the podcast, but I'll be doing it in the newsletter instead. So you can subscribe at christyharrison.com slash newsletter to make sure you get those going forward. That's christyharrison.com slash newsletter, and you'll get a special bonus Q&A right when you subscribe. So even though the podcast is going on hiatus, and I'm so sad about that, that doesn't mean that I'm going to be on hiatus. You just have to find me in a different place, which will be in your inbox. And if you want to ask a question for me to answer in the newsletter, as always, you can go to christyharrison.com slash questions. That's christyharrison.com slash questions. And I'll be answering past questions that people submitted for the podcast on the newsletter as well. Also, the podcast archives will continue to be here whenever you want to listen. And I'll be directing you to archival episodes in the newsletter, too. So, you know, I think the archives will hopefully be a really rich resource that you can continue to rely on even while we're on hiatus. I'm really sad to have to stop the podcast for a while because this week actually marks eight years since I started working on it, which is bananas. March of 2013 is when I started developing the show. And so I'm really hoping we can maintain what feels like such a special community here over on the newsletter. And at the same time, I also want to honor what we're going to lose in taking an extended pause from this podcast format where I won't be directly in your ears all the time. But there is one podcast I'm going to keep doing, even through the whole writing process of this new book, and that's the podcast that I do every month for my Intuitive Eating Fundamentals course. So if you want to keep getting new podcast episodes from me, even while I'm on hiatus, even while I'm writing this book, you can come check out the course and join at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. Also, if you want to hear more of my voice talking about anti-diet stuff, you can get my audiobook for anti-diet, which I narrate, and that's available at christyharrison.com slash book or wherever you get your audiobooks. So again, I won't be doing an Ask Food Psych here this week, but you can come ask a question for a chance to have it answered on an upcoming edition of the newsletter by going to christyharrison.com slash questions. So with that big news, and without any further ado, let's go to my conversation with Nancy Ellis Ordway. So tell me about your relationship with food growing up. Well, I think it was a lot like most people who grew up in the 50s and 60s, that food was certainly at the center of all of social, social gatherings, whether it was family or community, that there was always lots of food and lots of people enjoying eating. I was not really at all aware of diet culture uh, as a child because I really think it wasn't that big of a thing in those days. What I particularly recall, though, was when I when I got to college and part of freshman year of college is just getting to know people and hearing people talk about their families and their backgrounds and realizing that not everyone had the same experiences but listening to people talk about food in their families and how similar the stories could be that people would say, you know, in my family, we always do fill in the blank. And it's because we're Irish or because we're Italian or because we're German. And that people were describing really very similar kinds of customs around food and patterns around food, but they were identifying it as part of their community identity or part of their ethnic identity, even though the behaviors themselves were really similar. And I think that was where I first got really interested in noticing how people use food to do things other than simply fuel their bodies. That's interesting. So like the connection and celebration around food. Right. And, and things like 
never letting anybody leave hungry, always being a good host, making sure somebody, as soon as you walk in the door, they're offering you food and drink, those kinds of things as well. But everybody thought it was specific to their family background or their or their group and not realizing that eh, it's pretty much what everybody did. But that sense of identity being caught up in it, I just, I think that was the beginning of, of my interest in how people, how food is something that isn't just about eating, it's about socializing, it's about belonging, it's about establishing identity. Was that the case in your family? Did you feel like you had those connections around food as well growing up? We certainly had traditions that were, that were not breakable. I remember one year the whole family couldn't get together for Thanksgiving because my cousin had strep throat and they could, that, that branch of the family couldn't come. And you'd have thought it was the end of the world to not have everybody there for Thanksgiving dinner. And I mean, it wasn't her fault. She had strep throat. Right. Yeah. I feel like people always get sick around the holidays too. There's always somebody missing from my large family gatherings. That's interesting. Then you started to get interested in the meanings of food and people's connections around food. But it sounds like you didn't have any real issues of deprivation or dieting or imposed restriction on you when you were younger. No. And it was something that really, I don't remember even people talking about in general that dieting was just really not that big of a deal back then. And then I got to college and this was the early 70s. And I sort of you know how people change majors two or three times in the beginning. I ended up actually getting an undergraduate degree in home ec. So I had lots of foods classes and lots of nutrition classes. And that was just really interesting to me and learned a lot more about food customs in other areas and different ways of thinking about it. And, you know, the fact that not the entire world does not belong to the clean plate club, that sort of thing. And then I went on and got a master's degree in social work a few years later and got very, very interested in mental health and and therapy. So it was sort of just a natural fit for me to end up working in eating disorder treatment. How did you get interested in doing therapy and and doing a master's in mental health? The story that that I used to explain about getting into social work is I say, I think it's always a good idea if you can find a career that's based on what you most often got in trouble for as a child. And what I most often got in trouble for as a child was sticking my nose into other people's business. And so now I have a degree sticking my nose into other people's business. I make my living sticking my nose into other people's business. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where the interest in therapy came from. And then I had the opportunity in 1985 uh, I was I got a job at, uh, at on an inpatient eating disorder treatment program in St. Louis that was called ABTEC. If anybody remembers that, that standard for Anorexia Bulimia Treatment and Education Center, and uh, we had a 15 bed inpatient unit in the psych department specifically for people with anorexia and bulimia. And if you weren't in the field that long ago, it's it's hard to imagine how limited the resources were at that point, that, that there were very few books, there was very little, um, very little written about it, very little research. In fact, at that point, I was thinking about this the other day, we, we, when I started there, we were using the DSM-3, which, which the description of eating disorders at that point was really pretty limited. And, and so I kind of got in at the point where People were still figuring out what to do about it and figuring out what it was and trying to understand it more. But I also, part of my job was working on the unit itself, but part of my job was doing community outreach. And so I helped explain eating disorders to different groups in the community. I know for several years, I lectured once a term at School of Nursing at Barnes Hospital, which is affiliated with Washington University, that they had me come in and do a lecture about eating disorders because nobody else really was doing that at the time. And then I realized it was a bigger issue than just what we were seeing on the unit. And I sort of gradually had this growing awareness that the bigger issue really was weight stigma, that so many of the people we were seeing were pursuing weight loss because of the the messages they were getting from society and from the media 
about about weight. And you know, it's always a lot more than that. But just the idea that that misunderstandings about weight and nutrition and health, how that was that was part of what was driving people ending up in the hospital with anorexia and bulimia. And that that and then also gradually becoming aware that it was much more widespread than that, that there were lots and lots of people in the world who were engaging in one or more behaviors that would be considered disordered eating, but they thought it was what they were supposed to do because everybody was supposed to be trying to lose weight by then. It changed over time. And it was it was just, you know, interesting being the age that I am and growing up in the days when the most beautiful women in the world were Marilyn Monroe and Elizabeth Taylor and realizing how that shifted over time to the standard of beauty becoming thinner and thinner and then the pressures to be thin becoming greater and greater and more and more impossible to achieve and that that was that was part of the underlying cultural social issue that was then the most extreme version was people ending up in the hospital on an eating disorder unit but it was that was just like the tip of the iceberg and and i think other people have written about that about how that changed over time there's lots of history behind that but it just you know even when i took foods and nutrition classes as an undergraduate we didn't really talk that much about weight loss as being particularly important of course, in those days, nobody had yet figured out really what the deal was with cholesterol either. So there was a lot that, you know, there's there's been a lot more science that's come out since then about it, but it has shifted and I think it's it's still shifting. One of the ways I've talked about it is when I first started working in the field in the, in the late 80s, people who had disordered eating were more noticeable because they stood out more. And now everybody has disordered eating, it seems like. And and people who have really serious problems just kind of blend in sometimes and don't don't get the care that they need because they're doing what everybody else is doing. That's such a good point. I, I hadn't thought of it that way. I mean, it, our culture is so disordered on the whole these days. But it's interesting to think that there was a time when that wasn't really the case, when the sort of baseline of disordered eating wasn't as extreme as it is now. And so it, it actually did stand out for the people who had serious issues. I mean, even things like people talk about kids going off to college and the freshman or the freshman that was never that was never mentioned when I was in college. That was just not something that I mean, the expectation was you go off to college, you're still young, you're still growing. And in fact, part of my experience of being at college and living in the dorm was that the meals in the dorm were so chaotic and so noisy that I was very uncomfortable eating in the cafeteria, which was at that point the only place that you could eat. And I actually ended up convincing my parents to let me move into an apartment my second year at college because I was losing weight. And then once I could cook for myself and I could eat in a quieter place, then I got back on track. But the idea that, oh, everybody has to be worried about gaining weight when they go off to college, that was just not even on anybody's radar. That's fascinating. Yeah, I read somewhere one time about that that whole idea could be traced to um, when Jodie Foster went off to college, because when she was she was child actress. And so she was already getting a lot of attention from the paparazzi by the time she was old enough to go to college. And then that some photographer got this picture of her and she looked plumper. And then it became this whole thing about about girls gaining weight when they go to college. Well, yeah, you're still growing. For instance, if you look at a high school football team and a college football team, you don't expect them to all be the same size. No, and, and high school football teams are usually much smaller because they are still growing. Much smaller because they're still growing. So why do we put so much pressure on on kids to to not to not keep growing? So anyway, those are some of the things that I've that I've observed through the years and how that's related to weight stigma. And so in, in recent years I've I still I still I have a, a private practice in counseling and psychotherapy in Jefferson City, Missouri, I still see people with who've been diagnosed with eating disorders, but I also see a lot of people who are just uncomfortable in their relationship with food and their bodies. 
And it's very satisfying to be able to help people come to an understanding that this is this is not a fight that they have to keep fighting, that it's possible to just back off of that and say, you know, I'm going to I'm going to eat what I want. I'm going to eat when I want. I'm going to make my own decisions about eating and uh, and not keep trying to chase after that lower number on the scale. Yeah, I'm so curious for you, like how it evolved from those early days in the anorexia and bulimia center to starting to understand like the larger impacts and the, the sociocultural pressures that people were under that were sort of pushing them in that direction and in society at large as well, not just in people with clinical eating disorders. I think that happened really gradually over the years. I can't, pin, I mean, there were some moments that that stood out. Thinking back on it, some some years ago, I was involved in a group in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, a friend of mine who was a dietitian got me involved with this, and it was there used a long time ago. There was a program called Win Wyoming that it was uh, started by some people in Wyoming, and it was it was looking at the idea of if we really want to improve people's health, maybe focusing on weight is not the best thing to do. And and so there was this group in Columbia that was sort of trying to build something like that in in Columbia, Missouri, in this area. And part of, I remember it kind of foundered because there was a state dietitian at the State Department of of Health who just absolutely was not going to be involved in any program that did not weigh people and set weight loss as a goal. And she just sort of, I don't know, the, the whole thing kind of fell apart after that. But I met some really interesting people and read some really interesting information on different groups. And this would have been, let's see, this would have been in the in the early 80s. I'm trying to think exactly because I've moved several times. Which which time was that? But then getting more interested in that idea of we don't have to pursue weight loss in order to focus on improved health. And then, oh, I was at, I was at a conference at, I was at a Renfrew conference in Philadelphia. And I met a woman there named Claudia Clark. And she introduced me to the show me the data listserv. This is like way before Facebook and the internet was still just in its infancy and email was just coming into being. And it was an email listserv that was actually founded by Deb Burgard and some other people. Paul Ernsberger, I think, was involved. And it was like it was like coming up out of the water and being able to breathe air again to find this this email community of people who were thinking the same way and pursuing the same kinds of ideas. And and the name of the listserv, show me the data, was okay, you're gonna tell me that losing weight makes you healthier, show me the data. So there were a lot of researchers in that group. And then I don't remember, I should have looked up what year this was that a number of people from that group got together in Cleveland, I think it was, for really, it wasn't, it wasn't as much a conference as it was a retreat just to get to know everybody. And uh, Lindo Bacon was there and Carmen Cool was there and, and Dana Schuster was there, Judith Matz, Ellen Frankel were there. And then that was sort of the beginning of the Association for Size, Diversity and Health that sort of grew out of that gathering. And that's really been, through the years, that's really been a lifeline for me because if you live in a small town like I do and there's nobody else in the area who's ever even heard of this, then it's really important to have a community that you can go to where people understand it and don't have to have it explained again and and are on board with it. And that's one of the things that's been really wonderful about the internet is that we can all find each other now, like you and I found each other. And so a lot more has come about since then. But some of those early days were pretty lonely. I can imagine. And it sounds like you kind of independently stumbled into some of these ideas or maybe read and absorbed some of the same material that was coming out of the early health at every size movement, but you weren't plugged into that community yet. So it was basically just doing it on your own. Yeah, there wasn't as much of a community to plug (laughs) into. Uh, Another thing I remember is that early on, there was an argument about what we were even going to call it. Was it going to be health at any size or it was going to be healthy at every size? And it went back and forth for a while before it finally 
And I'm not even sure how that came about, that we made the agreement that we were all going to use the phrase health at every size. And then, of course, dieting programs were trying to co-opt that. And that's why the Association for Size, Diversity and Health trademarked the phrase so that it can't be used to promote dieting. Which is so smart. I mean, I wish that the authors of Intuitive Eating had trademarked that phrase. I ended up trademarking food psych for the same reasons because it's just so interesting how you have a, a term that's meant for a certain size inclusive community and then diety people want to come out of the woodwork and like take that for their own benefit. It's very frustrating. Very frustrating. And that I think that hap- that's happened with a lot of the different related but separate groups of, you know, body positivity and fat acceptance and, and, and the different that somebody comes along and tries to co-opt it into something else. And then we just have to keep getting the message out there. And doing that trademark enforcement <laughs> as well. That too. And I, I think of the, I think of the term upriver and downriver, which is apparently something that's been around for a long time, but I didn't encounter this kind of language until just a few years ago when I was actually taking a public health class about the story that the instructor told was, let's say that you and some friends are having a picnic one lovely summer day by the down by the river, and then you see somebody floating in the water and you go, oh my gosh, there's a person in the water. We have to get that person out of the water. And so you get organized and you pull that person out of the water. And by the time you get them up out into the shore, it's like, wait, there's another one and another one. And pretty soon you're all busy trying to pull people out of the water. And finally you say, you know, where are you all coming from? And one of them says, well, somebody up the river is pushing us in, but we're all so busy pulling people out of the water that we don't have time to go up river and figure out who's pushing them in and get them to stop. And that, that weight stigma has pushed us all into the water, all of us. And, and there are those of us who are, you know, individually trying to pull people out of the water. And then there are other people who are going upstream and trying to stop weight stigma from pushing so many people into the water. It takes all of us working together to change it. That's also part of why uh, I wrote a book that came out last year that I wanted to take all of the, all of what I've learned about working with this through the years and put it down in one place so that more people can access it. I can see people here in this area, but I wanted to be able to let more people know about how you can pull yourself out of the water and then ultimately what we can do about weight stigma individually and in groups, what can we do to push back against weight stigma and see if we can shift that focus? Yeah, a book is a good way to do that, right? Because it's sort of that combination of upriver and downriver effects. It's like you can have some cultural change effects by getting the message out there in a bigger way, and it can help individuals pull themselves out of the river, as you say. That's part of what I'm what I'm still working on is is figuring out more ways to push back against weight stigma, because ultimately, yeah, we need to be providing help and treatment to people who are really struggling right now. But if we want to end this or if we want to address it on a bigger level, we we need to address the weight stigma that is so woven into the fabric of our culture that people don't even notice it. People don't even realize it's there but it's still, it's still affecting them. Yeah, completely. It affects us all. It affects every level of culture. And how have you seen that change over the years with the sort of emergence of your understanding of weight stigma in the early days of your career? Have you just seen it sort of worsen and worsen and like the vice grip tighten on people over the years? Or were there distinct moments where it was like a quantum leap to the next level of weight stigma? No, I think it's just been gradual, you know, like a, a pot of water coming to a boil, maybe. In fact, I, I can't even pinpoint when I first started using the term weight stigma that, you know, I knew I had a sense of what it was, but I didn't have a term for it for a long time. And, and it's always nice to have language to describe it. But it's, yeah, it's been very gradual, but it's pervasive and it's, it's insidious. And it can be really hard to push back against if you don't have some community and some understanding of of how it came about. And that that even, you know, even the term health at every size, 
has been criticized for putting too much emphasis on health. But historically, that was where the very first push needed to be was because the general attitude was, oh, it's all about health. You need to lose weight for your health. Well, no, you don't really. So let's talk about it differently. Let's have a different phrase in it. And the health at every size movement isn't just about health. It's about now it's about social justice and it's about looking at at what all leads to these problems and what kinds of things can we do to try to change it we things like like food insecurity and and the research that's coming out now about children who grow up on on food stamps are more likely to have problems with binge eating as adults because they had this pattern of not enough food at the end of the month and then a lot of food at the beginning of the month and what does it say about our society that so many people are living like that? And and then it's a, it's a much bigger systemic issue that needs to be addressed. One of the one of the ways I've looked at this is um, talking about how focusing on on weight as a measure of health distracts policymakers from doing more important things. That social determinants are a much stronger predictor of health than weight or body size or even individual patterns of behavior. But if we have these big public health interventions that are focused on whole communities, let's get everybody to lose weight, well, then you have a really good excuse to not address poverty and to not address pollution and to not address access to health care and access to education and access to good jobs or clean water for that matter. You know, Flint, as far as I know, Flint still doesn't have clean water, but but it's so much easier to say, oh, let's do this intervention and teach everybody about good nutrition so they'll all lose weight. And then when it fails, it's like, well, people just aren't trying hard enough. Well, how about if you look at the intervention and back up several steps and think of doing something else that might work better? Yeah. That individual responsibility frame is just not helpful. And putting the onus on people to take charge of their own health, quote unquote, when it's like they don't have the means and the tools to be able to do that in the first place because they're being oppressed actively. There's only so much individuals can do. And I think that that is the idea that like this is such a distraction, that weight-focused health initiatives are a huge distraction from what really needs to be happening is such an important point and one that I don't hear enough people making. But I think that's really huge for anyone listening who is like a public health person or a health promotion person, anyone who's a provider who wants to help people's well-being. You know, I know for myself, when I first was working in nutrition policy, when I first made my career change or career addition, I should say, because I never really left my first career as a journalist, but I added on the second career as a dietitian and a, you know, master's in public health person. I went back to school and then started working in the you know city department of health and doing these initiatives to bring quote unquote healthy food into low income neighborhoods and you know there were some benefits and some things that were good about the programs but i think also like some really problematic elements and some weight stigmatizing language and teachings that we were doing in the in the programs and i never questioned it because the received wisdom that I had gotten and also my own disordered eating had told me that losing weight is always a good thing and it's it's better for health, you know, because that's what growing up in diet culture, that's what you learn. But I think that if I had realized, I think it might have it might have affected me and maybe I would have changed course a little earlier. I'm not sure. You know, I think that is that is a really important point that needs to get out there. And and I think it's you know it's a bigger issue in terms of of social policy that how often social policy is being made by people who don't have the problem and and they don't ask and they don't listen very well. I just ran across an example here in my own town last week that we have a farmer's market here in town, which is my favorite part of the summer because the stuff they have is just so good. But it, it's only open at certain hours. And I was out there a couple of weeks ago and there was a lady sitting all by herself at a table with a book. And she was trying to sign people up for a really well thought of program for people who are on food stamps. They can get additional vouchers to buy food at the farmer's market. What a great idea. 
except that the timing of the farmer's market is such that if you have to take the bus to get your groceries, the buses stop running and you can't take the bus to go to the farmer's market. And and they actually moved the farmer's market several years ago from one location to a little bit further out from the from downtown. And and now I'm wondering if that location would have worked better with the bus service. I'm sure it did. There were a whole lot of other disadvantages. But that idea of, oh, yeah, this is a great plan. Let's get farmer's market vouchers for people on food stamps, but let's not even ask whether the transportation works for them to get there. Right. And that's something that if if it had been the people who were actually affected making the policy, that would have never been an issue because they would have figured out how to address it. Of course. Of course, part of the problem we have here in town is when they have meetings to talk about whether they need to change the bus service, they have the meetings in the evening after the buses have stopped running. Oh, my God. <laughs> so no one who actually takes the bus can go. Exactly. Oh, my God. But those are those are social policy issues that happen when the people making the policy are not asking the right questions and not listening to the answers. I'm curious how you've seen that play out with in terms of weight policy and your role in health promotion, because I know you have a PhD in health promotion and curious where that fits in with your your training in psychotherapy and eating disorders and learning about weight stigma. Well, the, the PhD is, is recent. I just finished that in 2016. And the, the honest story about that is that my children went off to college and I got really bored. And so I went back to school and I literally picked that program because John Robison, who was also at the original ASDA meeting, uh, that's the department that he's in, in another state. And there was a program like that that was available to me. And so that's why I chose that program. And then incidentally, I ended up getting a graduate certificate in public health at the same time. And it was really remarkable to me how steeped in diet culture most of the people in those programs were and how much of it seeped into the classrooms. And, you know, when you're a student in the classroom, that's, a, that's kind of a vulnerable place. You know, you don't want to be the one who keeps making a scene over and over and over again. Uh, about how how this particular lesson is steeped in weight stigma, but I did I did speak up fairly often. You know, that's another place where how do we make systemic change? How do we address those issues in the training programs themselves and in the people who are teaching them, and help people become more thoughtful and more nuanced in, in how they approach it. And in fact, Heather Brown and I are currently in the process of co-editing a book that I believe the title we're going with right now is Weight Bias in Health Education, Critical Perspectives for Pedagogy and Practice, that it's a collection of chapters specifically looking at weight bias in educational programs for doctors, nurses, physical therapists, social workers, counselors, and offering a resource that can be used in training programs to give people a broader understanding of how weight stigma plays out in medical treatment and medical care. Oh my gosh, that sounds fantastic. Like such a needed resource for programs. What all is going into it? Like what are the recommendations that you have? Well, we've got chapters by a lot of different people coming at it from different points of view. I know one of the chapters is is about the research, the limited research that's been done on programs that address trying to address changing people's opin- attitudes about weight stigma in training programs. The chapter that I wrote is basically about this is why people don't want to come back to your office if you lecture them about losing weight every time they're there. If you want people to be compliant with your recommendations, these are some other things you could do. So looking at that, looking at the documentation that weight stigma does exist in medical professionals. I mean, there's some really robust studies showing that and talking about how that that interferes with people's ability to, to look past a person's weight and really focus on what their what their presenting problem is or what else might be might be going on with them. Yeah, that's kind of still in the works. We're at the point right now of reviewing chapter submissions, but that's that's been very, it's given me a, the opportunity to read a lot of really interesting stuff, which I always enjoy. And sounds like a very, a very needed resource in 
programs because it seems like in a lot of cases, you know, there's some shining examples that I can think of of programs that are bringing in more health at every size approaches and looking at, you know, weight stigma and the effects that it has. Like some dietitians now at Simmons College are learning about that through Marcy Evans and Lisa Pearl's program. There's John Robinson's program in health promotion. There's maybe a handful of other people that I can think of or programs that I can think of that are bringing in some haze, you know, Kendra Sonneville at um, University of Michigan. Like, so there's some great stuff happening, but there's also just so many programs that I think are so weight biased and almost, I don't know, from some of the interns that I've had and talking to them about what they've learned, I feel like in some cases it's getting worse than when I was in school. Like the, the weight bias and the emphasis on weight loss and the pathologization of larger bodies is just even worse than I remember it. Well, and part of it is because there's a lot of money to be made by doing it that way. You know, that's a big piece that we can't overlook is that when the AMA decided that they were going to classify it as a disease, they can make a lot more money treating it and the pharmaceutical companies can make more money treating it. Uh, Even if the treatment doesn't ultimately work, they can still make money from it. There's a term in hospitals that sometimes they refer to something as a cash cow. It's a program that's always going to be really, really profitable. And sometimes sometimes you need a couple of programs that are cash cows to fund all of the programs that tend to run in the red, like um, psychiatry, which tends to always run in the red. But, you know, I remember working years ago at the hospital when, um, when they were doing the liquid protein. Do you remember those? No, you probably don't. You're too young to remember those. I mean, I've heard of them. I don't, yeah, don't personally have any experience, but... Within the medical circles, that those were referred to as cash cows. That if you had a clinic that was not making money, you could set up and start doing that. And it didn't take very much time, and but it made a big profit. And it's important to remember that those kinds of things, if they're making money, then people are not going to want to let go of it. They're not going to want to change it. And they're only going to want to expand it and do more of it, right? Figure out how to how to make more money and more cash cows, how to you know, duplicate the cash cows. Yeah, it is super problematic. I'm curious on that note, like what you remember from the 2013 decision or back in the 80s and 90s, the sort of medicalization and pathologization. I keep using that word. I don't know if it's a real word, but pathologizing of (laughs) larger body size and creating this quote unquote war on obesity, right? Your memories or your experiences of how those decisions were influenced and shaped by pharmaceutical industry money, diet industry money, and other influences there. Yeah, well, one of the one of the things I remember pretty clearly was the the Fenfen Redux fiasco that um, I remember when Redux came out on the market and I can remember thinking, this is a terrible idea. This is going to end badly. And I was actually working in a setting at that point where I was working part of, part of the time in a psychiatrist's office. And so we had the, the drug sales reps coming in all the time. They were always underfoot. And the company that was making Redux, he was there passing out samples to the, to the staff. And it was a matter of, it was supposed to be indicated for people who had comorbidities, you know, people who were, who were not only heavy, but also had uh, diabetes or high blood pressure or high cholesterol or something like that. But primarily it was being prescribed to uh, middle-aged women who wanted to lose a few pounds to fit into a dress for a special occasion. And I can, I can remember just, just feeling frantic about it. Like this is going to end badly. And can, why can no one else see that? And then, and then part of what would happen in, in my setting was also people who were already taking a serotonin reuptake inhibitor like Prozac. And then their primary care would say, well, I don't like how much weight you've gained here. Why don't I put you on Redux? And not caring about the fact that that was contraindicated that can cause serotonin syndrome. If you take them both at the same time, it's very dangerous. And yet everybody was just so focused on the weight loss. And then, of course, it all did end very badly that that people were dying or having permanent heart damage from taking Redux. And it finally got taken off the market. 
let's see, the book about that is Dispensing with the Truth by Alicia Mundy, I think, that somebody mentioned one time. It's, it's, it's a long slog of a book to get through. It is absolutely amazing how she pulled all that information together and made it into a coherent narrative. And it's actually written, I think, more for lawyers than for people in our field, because it's about the lawsuits that happened. But it's just horrifying to realize that the pharmaceutical company knew that there was going to be problems with it. But the framing of it as they, oh, and they were really pushing it. They were offering free uh, continuing medical education programs for doctors to push the idea of how dangerous obesity was. And, and so then the trade-off was, well, you know, you use this medication. Yeah, a few people might get sick and die, but all of these other people are going to lose weight. Isn't that interesting? That was really kind of the framing that came across. Yeah, one of my life regrets is that I didn't start a scrapbook right at the beginning of that and keep every newspaper clipping in every magazine article because that was the way that, that it would come across in papers and magazines was... Yeah, maybe a few people die, but what the heck? All these other people are going to get thin. And and that's just, that's horrific. That's shameful. That's, that's vile. Yeah, completely. And I mean, it's so interesting, too, that the sort of quote-unquote need for it, for people to lose weight, was being trumped up by these pharmaceutical companies and continuing education classes, like creating the market for their product, basically. It's a very, um, very interesting book if you have the time and the perseverance <laughs> <laughs> to get through a really big book with a lot of legal terms. I've heard about that book and it's crossed my radar a few times and I never, never ended up getting it. But that's so interesting that it goes into this specifically because I'm starting to like do a little more investigative research into that area, that period in history when like the quote unquote obesity epidemic and framing of larger body size as a disease started to come about. I'm really curious what that looked like and how how that was shaped. And, you know, it really seems like pharmaceutical industry influence was huge, diet industry influence was huge, and just continued, you know, to march forward to the 2013 decision by the AMA to go against its own recommendation, its own panel's recommendation to not classify so-called obesity as a disease. And that it was the pharmaceutical industry again there that was responsible for that push. I'm trying to remember where I read this um, when Everett Koop was the Surgeon General and he started the Shape Up America program. And that what somewhere I, I, I read that Weight Watchers and Jenny Craig each donated a million dollars to that program because they knew that if the Surgeon General was promoting weight loss, that they were, they were going to get a lot of referrals from that. That is fascinating. It all makes so much sense. And yet it's like we don't see that history, right? Like, you know, you've lived through it. You know, other people have lived through it. But for me and my generation and also for people who just weren't really aware of what was going on at the time back then, it's kind of like, okay, this has just always been the case, right? It can seem like, oh, this is doctors tell people to lose weight because there's science behind it. There's science telling, you know, saying that, it's, you know, larger bodies are bad or whatever. And then when you actually start to dig around in the science and look at like where it comes from and who's behind it and, you know, ch like chase down the funding sources and also look at like the research that just refers back to other studies that refer back to other studies that, you know, you, when you get to like the primary source and you're like, oh, this, like this is what all these studies <laughs> keep, you know, a copy of a copy of a copy of. It's kind of mind boggling. Yeah. Yeah. And then you look at the original study, and sometimes it doesn't actually say that. Right. It's wild. And sometimes the abstract of the study says something totally different than the actual body of the study, and you have to really dig in to see what the findings truly are. And that was, that was honestly the reason that I went back to school to get a PhD, was because I wanted to be able to read the actual research papers and and look at the method sections and look at the statistics sections and and really see what they really said instead of just relying on the abstract or a press release to tell me. So so that's that's something I can get pretty nerdy about right now is <laughs> you know reading an article and then another one and then another one and oh the list there's this in the in the footnotes and let's go look at that one too. And yeah, it's kind of fun when you when you learn how to read the studies. Yeah. <laughs> 
but you know, not everybody does that. And if we, if we rely on the general press to tell us about that stuff, they don't always, they don't always get it right. They're, they're not in the business of teaching us science. They're in the business of selling a publication. Absolutely. And I mean, as I shared in my book, you know, like I was a journalist. I mean, I am still a journalist, but I was, I started my career as a journalist in like newspapers and magazines and went into health and nutrition as my beats. And like, I hadn't studied that stuff. You know, I did my graduate school later. I went back to school seven years after starting my journalism career. I just kind of learned on the job how to do, you know, health and nutrition reporting. But really the quote unquote reporting was often like reading the abstract of the study or reading the press release or, you know, talking to you because there's so much emphasis in journalism on like interviewing and talking to the source, right? So, you know, I'd call up the person who did the study and like talk to them about their study. But of course, the scientists are sort of trained to say the most catchy, you know, sort of things from the abstract that are like going to get media attention. And so, reporting that doesn't actually get at the nuances of like, well, what group actually had these outcomes? And I had no idea. And like so many of my colleagues and friends had no idea. I had studied rhetoric and French as an undergrad. You know, most of my journalism friends were like English majors, complet majors, rhetoric majors. We did stuff with words because we wanted to go into journalism, you know, but or journalism majors who don't really learn science. I mean, I think maybe some do have some science reporting classes and stuff, but it's not anywhere near the depth of what you get when you do like a master's degree and or a PhD and learn how to actually read the research. So I shudder to think the stuff that I reported back in the day that is just so wrong and so based on flawed evidence that wasn't evidence that didn't really show what it purported to show. And I think that's rampant across the media, especially now with newsrooms shrinking and journalists being mostly freelance in a lot of cases and paid very little and having to like crank out stories just to make ends meet. You know, there's really no incentive to like do a deep dive into what the research actually says. There's a lot more incentive to just look at the press release or look at the abstract and call up the researcher maybe. And that's it. And this kind of stuff is complicated and it can be hard to understand. And Most people don't have the time and the energy to dig into it. They just want an answer to the question. They just want to know, what should I eat to be healthy? And then there's always a whole lot of people lined up to tell them what to eat to be healthy that may or probably is not based in any kind of evidence. Right. And might be based on who's benefiting, who's who has an interest in telling you that it's really good to eat lots of, you know, cantaloupe or whatever. I don't know. I don't think there's a big cantaloupe industry necessarily. Maybe there is. <laughs> like eat lots of, you know, or like the the like chocolate and coffee and, you know, the studies that are like, this is good for you. No, it's bad for you. And then even understanding how things get published, that that if it comes up with an answer that people is not what people are looking for, then those studies don't get published, even though they may be really important information. Yeah, publication bias, such a real thing. And like, yeah, especially things, you know, there's a lot of studies that I would love to see the null results, right? Like I would love to see how many studies showed no no difference between the intervention diet and the control diet or how many studies showed that people who ate greater amounts of whatever nutrient didn't have worse health outcomes than people who ate less of it or vice versa. You know, I would love to see those studies that never got published because I think that would give so much more context and nuance to these conversations about nutrition. But again, that's a sociocultural thing that the people who do the studies are pressured to publish stuff that shows what they're supposed to show. I'm, I'm trying to remember where I I've I've accumulated all of this information over the years, and I don't remember where most of it came from. (laughs) But the the idea of um, chicken being more healthy for you than beef was due to a big advertising campaign that was funded by the American Poultry Growers Association. Oh, my God. (laughs) Of course. It makes so much sense. And yet, people, the average person doesn't know that it's not based on science. Right. It's all about the money. You know, when you're, when you're looking at stuff, evaluate who's, who's making a profit from this. And people, if they figure out the right way to spin it, they can make money off of it, even if it's, 
even if it's not true or in some cases where it's harmful. Yeah, follow the money, right? That's such an important lesson that we learned from Woodward and Bernstein, but, you know, applies to everything, really. Everything. I'm curious to hear a little bit about, you know, how you've seen the health at every size field change in the last, you know, 10 years or whatever that that it's started to get, especially in the last probably five years, that it's gained in popularity, you know, how you've, how you've seen things evolve. I think there are a lot of people who misunderstand it because I think the term gets used sometimes by people who don't really understand it and are picking it up someplace where it's not being explained very well. I think certainly the Association for Size, Diversity and Health has taken on much more of a social justice activism role uh, from the early days of just simply pushing back against stop telling us that it's healthy to lose weight. Stop, stop saying that over and over again. Here's, here's why that, that from that, it's ex- that, that that organization in particular has expanded to uh, looking at diversity issues and oppression issues and other social justice issues. I think anytime it comes up, there's always going to be some people who push back against it. There's always that accusation of you're just glorifying obesity. Yeah. Okay. What does that even mean? And, and I think a lot of times we're, we see more pushback because, because we're getting more, more recognition about it. And there are still a lot of people in the world who've invested an inordinate amount of time and energy in the pursuit of thinness. And, and it's hurtful to them to find out that the dieting was, was the life thief, as you put it, that what all have they lost because of that? And that's, that's difficult to hear. And, and there are a lot of people who just don't want to be wrong. One of my personal symbols that I, that I think about frequently is the tugboat. You know, when if you think about a great big majestic ocean liner that's sailing through the seas, but when it comes into port, it can't maneuver. And so the little bitty plain tugboats go out and they just nudge and nudge and nudge. And sometimes it takes several of them to nudge and nudge over and over again to get the ocean liner to change course and to come safely into port. And, and so when I get overwhelmed with things, I think, okay, what can I do today to be a tugboat? You know, where can I nudge? And if we're all tugboats, if we're all out there nudging together, eventually, maybe we can change the course. I love that. That's such a good metaphor. In a lot of ways, that's what social justice in general is about, is about we just have to keep nudging. I mean, sometimes it's about something that's much bigger than a tugboat. But a lot of times it's just, you know, it's in, in every conversation of when somebody says something that's, that's hurtful to find a way to let them know that. Uh, or if we see things, uh, you know, published in the paper to call and say, you know, I'd be available to give an interview and give a different point of view or, you know, whatever it is. There are lots of things that we can do as individuals, but it does help to have organizations that can get a little bit more clout with that. Yeah, organization is so key for some of this work. But yeah, I think it's that's such an optimistic and helpful way to look at things that you can be a tugboat and you can make these small changes or small efforts that can add up to big changes by just staying consistent and doing your part. And of course, that doesn't mean like having to do it every single moment of your life. There's certainly times when you might want to let something go or rest or there's not, you know, it's just not a, an appropriate setting or for whatever reason. But to be able to consistently make those efforts, I think, is, is helpful to pushing back against the crushing despair that sometimes threatens to overwhelm us. You know, I mean, I definitely have had moments of feeling like is, you know, where is all this going? Am I ever going to see change in my lifetime on this weight issue, but also on other social justice issues? Racism feels like a huge, not just ocean liner, but stack of thousands of ocean liners (laughs) to try to move, you know? Um, And so, but, you know, recognizing that we have to just keep making these efforts and that's the best outcome we can hope for. And personally, I'm not particularly shy about getting into conversations with people when they say something that feeds into weight stigma. 
And I've been that way for a very long time. One of the interesting things that I've noticed over the years is that I refer to my, my children refer to themselves as second generation Hayes, that, that that was what they were hearing at home from the time they were born. And, and sometimes we'll be somewhere and somebody will say something weight stigmatizing. And one of my kids or occasionally my husband will start the conversation first as sort of a way to head me off. <laughs> <laughs> But but it's nice to think that, that they're out there in the world saying things to people, too. I really hope we have more second-generation haze people in the world very soon. Well, you know, some of us have been around long enough that we've had kids who've grown up. So there's a growing group in that category, I think. And maybe soon to be third-generation in some cases. I know a couple of people in the movement who've had grandkids now. So it's like, okay, so there's... You know, hopefully that's just going to continue the Hayes lineage. Well, tell me a little bit about your book and your other work and where people can find you. Well, my book is called Thrive at Any Weight, Eating to Nourish Body, Soul, and Self-Esteem. I'm particularly proud of the cover photo, which Lindley Ashline took at the ASDA conference in 2018 when they had the scale smashing photo shoot. And uh, so she graciously let me use the photo of the smash scale on the, on the cover. Um, it's like I said, it's, um, it's mostly a collection of what I've learned through the years. I have a chapter that covers the science behind why diets don't work and why they're a bad idea. I have chapters on changing your relationship with food, changing your relationship with exercise. And then I've got a couple of chapters specifically on weight stigma. And then I have one section that's about tips for how to go to the doctor, how to survive doctor's appointments better, because that's a topic that just seems to come up over and over and over again. I also have one chapter specifically on children and what to do when children are being pressured about weight. And I, I have a website. Uh, if you just Google my name, Nancy Ellis Ordway, it'll take you to my website. I'm not particularly good at internet web stuff. So some of it, parts of it are pretty well up to date and a couple of sections are not. I need to revise the uh, recommended reading because there've been several books that have come out since I did that that are not on there yet. But that's, that's a place that has some information. And then I also have a Facebook page, Dr. Neo, which I use just specifically to repost all of the great articles that come across from like the Health at Every Size Facebook groups and the therapist groups and the ASDA groups and things like that. That's a place to, if, if you're looking for an article that will support an argument, uh, you can go to that and just kind of scroll through some of the, uh, some of the ones about that I've posted there in the past. I know your, your article about how weight is not What's the word I'm looking for with COVID? Oh, risk factor. A risk factor for COVID. Thank you. I've reposted that one several times. And when I, when I see other people who post something on Facebook about weight as a risk factor for COVID, it's like, oh, where's Christy's article? I need to post that <laughs> over here on their page. Oh, thanks. Because it's just, it's such a nice reference to have. So those are some of the places to, to find me. At this point, in terms of my private practice, I'm only doing online therapy, but I can only do therapy with people who are physically in a state where I am licensed. So if somebody's looking for a health at every size oriented therapist and you and you are physically in Missouri or Alabama, I could do virtual therapy. Well, that's great, actually, because I feel like those would probably be states that wouldn't have as much representation for Hayes. So good to have that option. Yeah, there's not not a lot of us here in Missouri, that's for sure. Uh, and I am also licensed in Alabama. That's a very long story why I'm licensed in Alabama. It doesn't matter. But um, that was something that when I started doing virtual therapy was made very clear that I can only see people who are actually in the state at the moment. Well, it's nice that you have now statewide coverage as opposed to in person. It would probably limit the people who come from all over the state. Absolutely. And I'm really, I'm honestly kind of hoping that that's going to be a benefit of the pandemic is that I'm hoping that more people, more insurance companies, more licensing bodies are going to be open to the idea of letting people do virtual therapy 
because there's so many people who can't access, who don't have access to a therapist who has any kind of background in eating disorders or even more so a dietitian with a background in eating disorders. And if we could have like nationwide licensing, then then it would be much easier for people to access quality care. I'm very lucky right now that I have a dietitian in the area who's really good with this stuff. So when I'm seeing somebody with an eating disorder, they can be seeing her at the same time. But that's not always been the case. It's so much better. It's so much better when I have a dietitian I can work with. Yeah. That's so the sort of gold standard for a treatment team, right? It's like a therapist and a dietitian and a medical doctor who gets it. And then you're golden. But of course, hard to find, hard to afford, hard to, the access is not there for so many people because of our healthcare system as well. There are a lot of psychiatrists who just don't get it. And, you know, I spend time, I have, I have sessions with people who are seeing me that the whole session is about how are you going to talk with your psychiatrist when you go back and see him and he wants you to, he's concerned about your weight gain from the medication, you know, you're doing so much better on the medication. Let's not mess that up. But how do you be prepared to talk to the doctor about that? Actually, I spend a lot of time talking with people about how to talk to their doctors about weight issues. It's unfortunately like so needed to have those conversations and to arm people with that knowledge because doctors are still so fat phobic. So fat phobic. Most of them are. And I'll just say this for, for your whole listening audience. Remember, you do not have to get on the scale. You have the right to refuse to be weighed at the doctor's office. If it's going to damage your mental health, don't get on the scale. Or even if you just want to make a point, don't get on the scale. You don't have, no, Medicare does not require it. The insurance company can get by without it. You can say, declined and they need to write that down. I'm sorry, something I get a little hot about because I've heard way too many people. Well, I've had, I've had experiences of people pressuring me to get on the scale. I just routinely don't. And I've had people argue with me about it. No, same. I've definitely had, you know, some doctors have been great and totally not worried about it or concerned at all. And some have pressured me or said weird things. And yeah, it's not cool. So Thank you for that. That's a good reminder. And they're just, people are so, it's like it doesn't even occur to them. How can it not occur to them? I was, actually, this story is in my book. I was at a, I had dropped by a, a doctor's complex to pick up something. And there was a, a young woman going around saying, they're having an open house down in the outpatient surgery clinic. You should go down and see the, the new outpatient surgery clinic. They have cookies. So, of course, I went down to see the outpatient surgery center because there were cookies. And, uh, and, you know, I did the tour because that's what you do when you're being polite and the scale, it wasn't like right out in the middle of everything, but it was in the hallway at an intersection of two hallways in a very non-private place. And so the, as I was getting ready to leave with my cookie, which was delicious, by the way, the director came over and said, do you have any questions? And I said, no, but I have a comment. I'm an eating disorder therapist. And I think having the scale where it is could be traumatizing for some people. And she said, oh, I never even thought about that. We'll have to look at that and see if we can find someplace else to put it. It was a tugboat moment. Yes, that's amazing. Those little moments are huge because that could save someone from getting triggered into a relapse, perhaps. And probably, probably more than one someone. So that was a very satisfying moment. Oh, Nancy, this was such a delight. I really loved this conversation and it's like flown by. I can't even believe it's already been more than an hour. But can you just tell us one more time what the address of your website is so people can find you and we'll be sure to put it in the show notes as well. N-E-O-M-S-W.com. But if you just, I'm the only Nancy Ellis Ordway. If you just Google my name, you'll find my website, you'll find the book. <laughs> And then the Facebook page is Dr. Neo. It's big D, little R, period, capital N, capital E, capital O. Yeah, we'll put links to all that in the show notes so people can find you. I'm totally jealous of being the only person with your name because that is not the case for me. <laughs> well, I've also spent 40 years arguing with people about it. So uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are advantages and disadvantages. To it. No, no, you have to put the whole thing. I'm in the E's. I'm not in the O's. Oh, yeah, that's true. 
it's frustrating. Well, thank you so much again. It's great to talk with you. Well, you're very welcome. And thank you for having me. So that's our show. Thanks again so much to Nancy Ellis Ordway for joining us on this episode. And thanks to you for listening. If you've gotten something out of this podcast, please help us reach more people who need to hear the anti-diet message. Even though we're going on hiatus, there's still going to be a whole library of content to share. And I'd love for you to subscribe if you haven't already on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. You can see lots of different ones to subscribe at at christyharrison.com slash subscribe. That is christyharrison.com slash subscribe. And of course, we still love nice ratings and reviews to help other people discover the show. It's always so appreciated. If you're looking for some practical tips to help you get started on the anti-diet path, you can grab my free audio guide, Seven Simple Strategies for Finding Peace and Freedom with Food. Just go to christyharrison.com slash strategies to get it. That's christyharrison.com slash strategies. To get full show notes from this episode, including all the resources we discussed, plus a full transcript, just go to christyharrison.com slash 270. That's christyharrison.com slash 270. And to get the transcript, just scroll down to the bottom of the page and enter your email address. And by the way, that'll sign you up for my email newsletter as well so that you'll get new editions of Food Psych Weekly as soon as they launch starting next week. This episode was brought to you by my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals. If you're ready to make peace with food, break free from diet culture, and reclaim the life it stole from you, along with a wonderful community of other people on the same path, you can learn more and sign up at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. And again, that's the place where I'm going to continue doing a monthly podcast for course participants. A big thanks, as always, to our editor and sound engineer, Mike Lalonde, our community and content associate, Vinci Chui, our administrative assistant, Julianne Watasik, and our transcriptionist, Mycroft Holmes, for helping me out with all the moving parts that go into producing this show every week. It takes a village, and if it weren't for them, I know I would have had to go on hiatus a long time before this. So thank you to them for all of their help over the years. Our album art was photographed by Abby Moore Photography and designed by Melissa Alam. Our theme song was written and performed by Carolyn Pennypacker Riggs. And I'm your host and producer, Christy Harrison. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, stay psyched. Ooh.